Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the bucket corner. The planning committee joins me in thanking you for arriving early so that we can get virtually 90 people into the room before the class starts. If you will, check your cell phone to make sure it's silenced. We'll get right into our class this morning. Uh, George has said that he is uh, getting behind, so we're going to get him <laughs> 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 um, I had one suggestion from a classmate uh, here who didn't, wasn't at all concerned about George getting behind and thought the solution to that would be to just let him keep right on teaching until about the 4th of July. <laughs> 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 So once again, this is the fourth class of a five-class course on the, our Constitution from um, beginning to end. <laughs> and here is, that's what it's become. <laughs> but here is Professor Emeritus of History at Grinnell College, George Drake. Green, yeah, the green light came on. So, yes, uh, increasingly uh, as I'm going along, I'm trying to incorporate some of the things I thought I would do at the end. Uh, and many of the things I thought I would do at the end, we probably won't get to. I'm, I'm an historian. I love origins and the way things develop. And you're getting some of that. But obviously of greater interest to you is the Constitution itself and what we make of it today. That's, that's where... It's relevant. And I was particularly pleased at the last class by the questions and comments that came up. I think what, what I sense is happening, you're getting a, well enough acquainted with the Constitution and what we're doing that more things are occurring to you and, and they come up. And uh, what I'm going to do before we get uh, to the document itself, and again I'll pull out of my pocket the handy dandy Constitution, uh, is comment uh, on some of the questions that were left a little bit unresolved last time and I said I would take a look uh, to see what I could uh, resolve and perhaps some of you have done that as well. Then explain the handout, the two handouts that you have, which I think will be the last one you'll get. So you're getting a pretty big packet of, of things, but that, that's as much as I plan to do and I debated whether to give them to you today or wait till the last time, but because we, but I will just, what I'll do is to tell you a little bit about each of those documents so that then when you read them on your own you can I think appreciate them and see whether they fit in the context of the unfolding constitution. First of all, um, Gordon's question about a germ. I did look at the Oxford English Dictionary, and as uh, early or late in the 17th century, the meaning of a germ is pretty much what we have today, I and mean, it means to suspend or you know close out a meeting. So that uh, uh, when, when they talk about adjourn, they're using it, that in interpretation. States and citizenship, that came up last time. And I have had a harder time actually nailing that down because I haven't seen anything specifically for any specific state. But uh, remember these folks are coming out of a British colonial experience and they have not had very much time as states. They begin to call themselves states once the revolution begins, and once they, in 1776, on and on, they begin to make state constitutions. But the sense of citizenship up to that time was not sort of official governmental statements, but participation in civic activity. Uh, so a more a sense of participation than a status of naturalization or uh, going through classes and so on and being made a citizen in that way. And so it looks as though the uh, Constitution itself is, is sort of beginning a process of actually nailing down what it is to be a citizen in there. And uh, there isn't a whole lot of background for, for that. Uh, and so far as I can tell, maybe someone will find something that's a little more specific than that. Presidential pardons, we talked about that last time. And I had suggested, and it turns out that I was more or less correct, that they're coming out of the British royal precedent, that the monarch has the, the capacity and the ability to pardon by virtue of being the monarch. Now that seems a bit strange within the context of the making of the Constitution at this time because they're so anti-monarchical. They don't want a 
the monarch, but they do incorporate that element of past practice within the British Constitution into their American Constitution. Interestingly enough, one of the very first exercises of the presidential pardon came early in a term rather than late as it's doing now, and this was Thomas Jefferson. You remember the Alien and Sedition Acts passed under uh, President Adams' uh, administration in 1798. And this, this is the period of the Napoleonic Wars, the British versus the French, and the whole ways in which that spilled over into American practice. At that particular point, there were more, they were having more problem with the French than, than with the British on the high seas in terms of intercepting neutral ships and so on that were trading with the, with the enemy. And so it, it, uh, it, it's one of those infamous moments in American history where some really draconian acts are passed by the Federalist Congress that uh, re made new arrivals aliens for itself for five years, uh, for 14 years, changed it to 14 years. And a lot of people say that just trying to get rid of votes for the Republicans, because no, no some of the new arrivals were Republican rather than Federalists, and that was part of it. But it also meant that these folks are much more vulnerable, and you could, in terms of national security, you've got much more leverage against them if they're, if they're not classified as citizens. Plus, uh, sedition against the U.S. government is greatly broadened in these acts. And Jefferson, before he became president, was so opposed to those acts that he sponsored the two, two resolutions, the Kentucky Resolution, and he actually wrote the Virginia Resolution, uh, which were the first official acts of a state to nullify federal law. So you're getting into this issue, nullification becomes a big issue in the Jackson administration, and of course a huge issue at the time of the Civil War. Uh, where the southern states are saying, uh, proclaiming they have the right to nullify any federal law. Well, what kind of a nation do you have if you have that right? But Jefferson begins the process in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, which call for nullification of the Alien and Sedition Act. It, did, they did, it didn't happen, but uh, that was the, what, what those acts called for. So Jefferson was so incensed against the Alien and Sedition Act, so as soon as he becomes president, he pardons people who were convicted under the Alien and Sedition Act. So that's one of the very first exercises of presidential pardons. Okay, I think I picked up on many, if not most, of the issues that were sort of left hanging last time. Now, the handouts. Um, you have two, and one is from the Federalist Papers, and it's Federalist 51 by James Madison. The uh, author of the papers at, at the time. And remember, well, let me just give you the general outline. There are 85 Federalist papers, now considered collectively one of the great um, set of constitutional documents ever written in terms of constitutional law. And we're immensely uh, rewarded and enriched by the fact that people who help to make the Constitution have this opportunity to explain what the Constitution means and what they were about in the process. They are newspaper articles published in various New York papers, all of them in the state of New York. Hamilton organized the Federalist Papers and enlisted Madison and John Jay to help. Jay wrote only five of them. There are 85 total. Jay wrote only five of them. Uh, Hamilton wrote the bulk, oh, around 50, and Madison wrote the rest. So there's some, or some argument between Hamilton and Madison once they became bitter political opponents as to who wrote what. And there, there, there probably was some cooperation at the time between them. But Hamilton organized it, and he enlisted the help of Madison and Jay. And uh, Madison probably, in terms of uh, great statements of political theory within the American uh, canon is Madison's uh, Federalist Papers are probably the ones we turn to the most. The two most famous of Madison's are Federalist 10 and Federalist 51, and you have 51. I didn't, I didn't do 10 because it's longer and in some ways a little more difficult to unpack 
and it doesn't cover as many issues as does Federalist 51. What Madison manages to accomplish in Federalist 10 is to counteract, try to, try to counteract the argument of the Agro-Federalists that a, a nation as large as the United States, and potentially as large as the United States, could never be governed by a Republican form of government. Because they th they're thinking of Athens and Rome and so on, and places that are much more contained. And here's this sprawling continent. And how can you possibly have a Republican government managing the sprawling continent? And what Madison does in Federalist 10 is make an argument that it's all to the good. So many interests are there, and they just keep counterbalancing each other, and so they nullify each other. No one interest is going to predominate. But that's, and it's a, a, a fairly elaborate argument in 10. It, he gets into it in 51 at the very end. He says something about size being an advantage rather than a disadvantage. But just quickly uh, note that it, it, another reason for using 51 is he, he talks a lot here that relates to basic constitutional theory drawn from Locke and Monk's view. Because he's, he's arguing about the separation and balancing of powers. He says ambition should be made to counteract ambition. These go government officials are going to be ambitious. So let's create another set of government officials in a separate department that will blunt their ambition by their own ambition. Uh, he said, we wouldn't need government if we were angels, but men are not angels, so we have to build a government that contains, contains ourselves. Um, so uh, enable the government to control the government and itself. So this is the bulk of the uh, 51 is about that. It's pretty clear. I think you'll have fun reading it. And then again at the end he said the larger the society is more capable of self-government. Now, to give you an example of an anti-federalist argument. This is by, uh, it's Brutus. But by, the, by the way, all of the Federalist papers were published over the name Publius. Everyone's Publius. Uh, but you've got a lot of different names attached to the NFL. Cato, they, they say they're drawing from Roman uh, experience. And these folks are steeped in Roman uh, political history. So Brutus, his, his real name was Robert Yates. He was a judge, a, a New York judge, a, an ally of Governor George Clinton of New York, who was, who was um, adamantly anti-constitutional, anti-federalist. Uh, he wrote 16 essays in 1787 and 88. This is, they're written during the process of ratification of the Constitution. It needs nine states. So once the Constitutional Convention ceases, then you've got each of these states, most of them, you can either do it through the legislature, or favored to do through, through constitutional conventions, and they were called, they most called conventions. And so New York is a key state, and they're gonna argue, argue the case out. And most of the, most of the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers come out of New York. Some, uh, uh, Patrick Henry was one of the, one of the chief anti-Federalists, but he tended to talk more and write less. Uh, so there, we don't have as much for Patrick Henry as we have from some of the others. But interestingly, it was New York. And it turns out that by the time New York got around in its convention to voting, uh, Virginia had already ratified the ninth state. So it, their, 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 their vote, and it's nice, and they vote by, I think, three votes. The, the, the convention was packed, packed by anti-federalists, but by this time, since it's going to be adopted anyway, by the federalists actually win the vote by about three votes in New York. So, I, I chose this one because I, I like, Brutus is very easy to read, very direct, right straight to the point. I apologize for all the underlinings, you're getting my underlinings, but I hope you could read through those. But what Brutus is arguing is, if you give all of this power to the federal government, you'll never get it back. So once you, once you approve this constitution, uh, the game is over. We lost. So think about it. Just think about it. Think hard about what you're doing. It's going to take, this constitution will take way too much power from the states. The taxing power of this federal government are very, very dangerous. There's no limit to what this federal government can squeeze out of this. Uh, you can decide whether or not he is correct in, in, in that fear. But, you know, it's, it's a so much stronger power of taxation than, than we're in the Articles of Confederation. The danger of federal military power. We're going to get a standing army here. 
which is going to be forced us to pay those taxes. You don't know, look out. Federal law will be supreme, and it, it, it will annihilate state courts, and ultimately this federal government is going to annihilate state governments. And remember, Hamilton has already argued at the Constitutional Convention that might be a good idea. Let's just get rid of the states. So he's not, you know, he's, he's not inventing all this. And then the United States is way too large for free government. And what, the way he argues that, and it's, it's a under, very understandable argument. This is going to be a sprawling nation. We're going to have one capital city where the government will be. How can someone out on the frontiers of Kentucky have anything to say about what's going on in D.C.? <coughs> with, with the communication we have and so on, it's just not going to work. <coughs> so this notion of representative democracy, we're sending somebody to Washington who will represent us. That person's going to go to Washington and do exactly what he wants to do. And we'll never be the wiser. We're just too, we're just too big. Uh, so anyway, that that's uh, uh, generally the argument that you get in uh, Bruce. So it, I think it's kind of fun to see how how many open questions there were and, and concerns there were at the time creating the Constitution. Okay, now uh, mine's red, yours is blue. That means nothing about politics. <laughs> Uh, believe it or not, I am so sanguine that I think we'll at least get to, we've got Articles 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Once we get through 3, I think it'll go fairly fast. Uh, when we get to 4, we deal with the states uh, and the relation to the federal government. Article 5 is how amendments happen, and I think most of us know that through the state's program, and we'll talk about it. Article 6, I sort of label a, a miscell miscellany, a miscellaneous article. And Article 7 is the ratification, also with a few corrections to be made in the document that they can ratify. So, Article, article 3, the judiciary. Not a long article, but a very power, very important one. And remember, the Articles of Confederation had no judiciary, federal judiciary. And one of the interesting things which, you know, even lawyers, I think, have a little difficult time resolving, and we'll talk about it when we get there on the next page, we're on page 16 now, is concurrent jurisdiction between states and federal government. And we're going to end up, it's very interesting when you think about it, we end up very much more under state law than we are under federal law. There are lots of federal laws, but there are a lot more state laws. And there are 50 different systems of state law. Think about uh, Louisiana, that's the most important, which is looking at the Napoleonic Code when it's making its, its legal system. And so it's a very much more top-down sort of Roman law system than the common law, English common law system, a very different system of law than any of the other states. We are, anybody thinking about becoming a lawyer who is a lawyer, what's the great uh, hurdle to pass? The state law which is mostly learning about the state laws. Uh, and we, uh, every individual in this room, is much more under the law of Iowa than we are under federal law. But how, how are you going to adjust that? How, and we do know you move from state uh, law to federal. There, there are appeals to, uh, from state law. And, and there, there, what happens if in a, a state, something that's been resolved within the states and then there are appeals, if it gets to the state Supreme Court, it can be moved to the federal appeals process if it is, if you can make a case that the state ruling is anti-constitutional, it goes against the Constitution, because in the Constitution it says that the law of the United States shall be supreme, the power of it overall of the law. So you can move in, uh, in appeal cases into the federal system from the state system, and then we'll see in the Constitution as so it's a bit muddy the way it's stated, but at least for me as a non-lawyer, uh, it's, it's, it's in this section that, you know, there's a lawyer who's making the document, and most of us can't read lawyerly languages today, and I've, been, I've made the point that uh, we're lucky that these lawyers seem to be able to write more clearly than current lawyers. <laughs> I don't mean to attack the lawyers, but, uh, and so more or less we can understand what, what they've said, but when you get into this legal talk, it, it, to me anyway, it gets a little more complex. Oh, anyway, so let's do the judiciary. Section 1. 
The the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. And what they've ordained and established is a um, two-layer system. You've got federal district courts uh, and multiple, I don't know how many district courts we have in Iowa, it's at least three, I think, if there are three three federal district courts. And then you've got the Affair Federal Appeals Courts, and what are there, 12 federal judicial, I should know that, but there are many fewer of those, and those are at the next level between the district courts and the Supreme Court. So that's what, in fact, Congress has created, is, is that two, two, a three-layer system, Supreme Court, Appeals Courts, and District Courts. Uh, okay, the judges, both of the Supreme and Inferior Courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior. (laughs) What does it mean? (laughs) It means that these are lifetime appointments unless you are a bad behavior. (laughs) Yeah, so you can impeach judges. Now, in in Iowa, we know we elect them. It's an elected process uh, for our our courts. And you can de-elect them. And people are up for, rat- essentially, they're up. No one's essentially running against them, usually, but they're up to be ratified or not. We do not elect our judges. We okay, ratify right. their position after four years. And their continuance is dependent upon public vote. They're nominated by the governor through a commission and named to the courts through a commission. We do not elect them. Then we have a chance to ratify their election. But we have a chance every four years to affirm their position as a judge. Thank you, Gordon. Again, it's really nice to be talking to people who know things. <laughs> okay, so good behavior means, uh, you know, when we, we talk about this. When, when, when one of the things we focus on, often, most often, are Supreme Court uh, appointments by the president to be ratified by the Senate. Yeah. The Bob? one thing I was thinking of was the Supreme Court, because I was reading it, when Douglas got to the state that he was, that they persuaded him that he should resign. Nothing, he had to resign because of the whatever way he was going on the end. Yeah, so, so Bob's comment is the resignation of, Ju- of Justice Douglas. And yeah, you know, I mean, obviously a person comes in, and we see this all the time. Most of our Supreme Court justices don't die in office. Uh, they, I think we've been very fortunate in the fact that people, you know, they're surrounded by colleagues and they're surrounded by uh, clerks and so on. And I think they get a pretty clear sense of when they're past it, or when they don't want to do it anymore and they're tired of doing it. So in fact, uh, lifetime appointment doesn't usually turn out to be a lifetime appointment, but you have it. And, you know, I think you can easily see why you have this, because they're, they're thinking about the British system, where uh, because of monarchical appointments and because they can be withdrawn, uh, the judiciary in, in 18th century judiciary is not as independent as uh, what they're going to make within the Constitution. Meaning, again, here's Madison, his arguments about um, strength balancing strength ambition balancing ambition you don't want a court dependent upon the executive and the congress in order to continue to serve you want a court that can be independent and a a a different locus of power and believe me this was debated during the uh, ratification process do you want to give the judiciary that much power and i think you could make the argument today that oftentimes Judiciary turns out to be the most powerful part of the federal Absolutely. government yeah. because yeah. of judicial review, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, what shall I say? You know, Citizens United. The only way you're going to get rid of that is with a constitutional amendment. Will we get a constitutional amendment? I don't think so. Citizens United is the one that's allowed uh, this sluice of money to come into politics, and you know, with not identifying the source of the money. In, in, on the argument is that's free speech. Uh, Lola loaned me a book called The Invisible Constitution, uh, which is t- it's a very good book by uh, Lawrence Tribe, a constitutional law professor at Harvard. 
about all the elements in the Constitution that are not written, that become constitutional, but are not written in the Constitution. Um, we are a government of laws, not of people. That's not in the Constitution, but that's part of our legal principle. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. That's not in the Constitution. Free speech is guaranteed in the Constitution. Is money free speech? Um, the Koch brothers' speech is a little louder than mine. Uh, do they have the right to multiply their voice through monetary contributions? Well, it's been decided by our Supreme Court that they do because they have that, their money is, their, is, is a form of their speech. Now, that's not written in the Constitution, but the Supreme Court has decided that, that the meaning of the word free speech can be extended that way. And that's one of the problems with the Constitution, an 18th century document adjusting to con contemporary circumstances. Um, search and seizure and so on. And th that, the things that, that if um, electronically I eavesdrop and I seize your information, is that constitutional? Uh, the 18th century people didn't envision that at all, but the courts are going to interpret whether that's constitutional or not. So there is, there is a huge invisible um, penumbra around the Constitution and the words in the Constitution as circumstances change, and then you have to interpret whether those circumstances are constitutional or not. And it's the court system, and ultimately the Supreme Court, that makes those decisions. So the more you get into that area of the invisible Constitution, the more power the courts have. So, in a way, the complexity of life today balanced against an 18th century document, I think, enhances the power of the courts, and the courts have, have incrementally uh, become more powerful, and certainly the executive has become more powerful than they, I think, at least most of the founders had envisioned it would do. They, it was, they made no bones about it at the time. The legislature is the center core of the government. For them. Okay, so good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance of office. So you can't reduce their salaries. You can increase it, but you can't reduce it again. We can't discipline them, as say the Congress or the executive, most of the Congress. We don't like what they're doing, we're going to cut yourself. Uh, so there, this is another. Uh, element here is trying to strengthen the independence of the judiciary. So that first article creates the basis for a powerfully independent judiciary. Number two, um, the judicial, judicial power shall extend to cases in law and equity. Let's talk, stop there for a minute. What I think they mean here, and I'm not a lawyer, and if there are any lawyers in the audience can, exact, can quickly uh, straighten this out. When they say law, they mean English common law tradition, which is essentially the, the bulk of our legal tradition. Well, now, common law developed in England as a result of individual laws and individual cases, interpreting laws, that gradually ascended into a body of law through practice. So, what the lawyers do today, they look for precedents. I mean, we watch, at least on, on TV they do, when we watch TV lawyer dramas, why, the brilliant lawyer founds, finds this precedent that, that goes against, that no one knew about, and, and he comes up with it. They, they used to talk about shepherding a case, and, and, and then in the days before the internet and electronic means of doing it, you had in law offices these shepherd books. They were actually published in Colorado Springs, very close to Colorado College, where Sue and I were, uh, shepherd publishing company that did all that, and you had to shepherd the case, look for all the precedents. So that's, that's the common law tradition. And it started developing in the Middle Ages in England and became this great assemblage of, of case law. And equity, that I think is referring to the Roman law tradition, which is a tradition that cuts across, overlays and cuts across the common law. That, and it enters into European law in the, during the Renaissance, the 16th and 17th century. They're discovering a lot about Rome. And the notion in Rome is that you have an equitable lawgiver, the head of state, who is um, so fair-minded that will make the right decision. 
So it's, it's, a, it's a top down kind of law, whereas common law is definitely a bottom up sort of law. And there is an element of equity tradition. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but I've always felt that Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, Pika, that desegregated our schools after virtually a century of segregation and a century of law. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson in the 1880s and so on, that said separate is equal. So you can have separate schools as long as they're equal. Well, we, our society had looked long enough at separate and equal that we realized separate isn't equal. It's not equal. So in equity and in very injustice, we have to overturn all of these precedents. And we do have, you know, precedents, a long tradition of precedent law that can, is overturned and can be overturned. If we were locked into precedent law, uh, you wouldn't have that flexibility. But that, that you can come along at a certain point and say, equity, fairness, uh, overrides precedent. Uh, and, and, and that's probably a very, that's a very clumsy and a raw way of looking at it, but it's my way of sort of simplifying, trying to understand how you can overturn this long tradition <coughs> of law, of, of precedent law, and get a different uh, form of law implied. So I think that's what they mean. Law, these are the two forms of law in our society. Arising under the Constitution. Okay, now let's look at it. Judicial power shall extend to all cases of law and equity arising under the Constitution. Judicial review. And the question always is, where does the Supreme Court get the right to be the arbiter of what is constitutional and what is not constitutional? And it, it, it comes from various, well, I'll put it this way. There, there is Marbury versus Madison in 1803, where the, the uh, Marshall Court, where John Marshall, the is, is a great architect of the Supreme Court, really, uh, hands down a judgment which specifically says this court has the right to interpret whether the law is constitutional or not. So there's the first point at which it is asserted certainly by the court itself, that it has that power. But, he's, he argues it's constitutional, and he can point to things like that, arising under the Constitution, within the Constitution. There also was precedent for judicial review in states, and also in the Federalist Papers, particularly Hamilton talks about judicial review. So it's, it's in, it's in the, the DNA of the society, of the people who are making the Constitution, but it's never explicitly said in the Constitution that the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review. Uh, but it, you, get, you can pull it out arising under the Constitution. And I think I'll point out one other place where they can find it. So anyway, judicial review is going to be established, which is the real power of the Supreme Court. It is the body of government that can decide whether a law comports with the Constitution or does not. And if it does not, it's out. You throw it out. Okay, uh, uh, rising under the Constitution, the laws of the United States, the treaties made or which shall be made under their authority to all cases affecting ambassadors and other, other public ministers. So these are <coughs> cases where the judicial, where the Supreme Court has uh, primary jurisdiction. Consuls, they're doing a lot here with, with our diplomacy. To all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies to which the United States shall be a party. Controversy between two or more states. Okay, here we are. There are these separate states coming together. They're used to having controversies between them and to being able to, you know, the, the Article of Confederation said that Congress should mediate. And it has a whole long section of the articles as to how, what that pattern will be. Congress will do it. Now you're going to shift it over to the Supreme Court. They need something to resolve disputes between the states. And the federal court system will be that something. When, when two states are, are uh, added in a legal sense. Okay, and between citizens of different states. Again, um, I've got a problem with somebody in Nebraska. And uh, who's, which court? Is the law, Nebraska court or the Iowa court is going to handle it? Well, if Iowa court does it, I might be an advantaged. Nebraska court has it, I might be disadvantaged. So let's put it in the federal court system. It's fair. Um, between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states. So there's a land issue with me and someone in, in, uh, in Nebraska again. So 
That's under, under the federal court system. And grants of different states and between the state or the citizens thereof and foreign state citizens are subject. So trying to trying to lay out here the possible areas where you need a an independent, presumably fairer arbiter to come in to a uh, judicial thing. Jack. Uh, when you have the Mississippi River or whatever river that divides a couple of states and it changes its course a little. <laughs> <laughs> because of state who decides where that line is? The question is, when you have a, you're along the Mississippi River, and there's a flood or something like that, and the river changes course. And so now a piece of land that was on one side of the river is on the other side. My guess is it calls into the federal system, but I'm just guessing. Who, who has jurisdiction over it? So, I don't know, there was uh, a similar case that's still talked about up in northwest Iowa where the Missouri River changed. Right. Yeah. And so you've got some Iowa land in Nebraska, and there was one case, that, and I, I can't give you name and number and all, but where Indian, the Native Americans lost land, and the courts decided that they would get their land back after the river changed course. And people up in Northwest Iowa still talk about that. Because and, there's and, still some yeah. friction between the reservations that are there and the... Mm -hmm. And that, that, I think, would go to the federal courts. The qu question, what the comment that Dorothy made was the issue along the Missouri River in northwest Iowa, where a land that once was Iowa is now on the Nebraska side of the river. I heard something today on NPR, and some of you may have, about, uh, is it Wyoming, where an Indian reservation is now being determined to have land having take, been taken from them illegally, and it includes the town of Riverton, uh, Wyoming. And so the folks of Riverton are facing the issue of maybe becoming part of the reservation. Uh, and I, it's still, it's up in the air, but again, that one is with, but that's between Indians and the state, so I think that would be a federal, federal decided issue as well. Um, jo Joanne is flashing, has been flashing the time card at me for a while, and it looks like we are, um, wow, we're still in Article 3. Yeah. <laughs> But we're doing lots of history. Uh, so, uh, but once we get there, uh, I'm <laughs> So we better take our break right now and we'll come back and dig in again in Article 3. Thank you. Thank you for taking your seats, everyone. We will begin as, as soon as everybody is seated and uh, George is ready to go. Uh, for the, the uh, fourth class, the five-class course, and we have more than five classes for this, uh, uh, our Constitution from origin to implementation. <laughs> George Strait. Well, I'm turning this on by Greg Bucks had a question that he said, is it okay to ask it? And I said, sure. So Greg, where are you? Where, there you are, Greg. Yeah, section three, <clears throat> paragraph three of section of article three. Uh, says that in cases where a state is a party to a lawsuit, I guess, um, or a dispute that's in court, um, the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction I'm not sure of the meaning of original jurisdiction because I know of at least one case in Iowa where the state of Iowa was a party to a, to a lawsuit. And I don't know if the Supreme Court had any role in that or not. Well, yeah, and I, 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 I invite you to ask the question. I'm inviting myself to say I can't quite answer, quite, quite answer it because in, in the, uh, if, you're come, if, you, if you appeal out of the state Supreme Court, uh, on the basis of its the decision was unconstitutional, the Supreme Court has the ability to decide to accept the case or not. They could conclude that it's not an important constitutional matter and not accept it. But that's an appeal rather than original jurisdiction. You're talking about original jurisdiction. And, and what, what uh, Greg is pointing to is that third paragraph on page 17. In all cases affecting ambassadors and other public ministers and councils, and those in which a state shall be party. Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. Um, and I think, but I think it's got to be a state, a party 
to some external uh, jurisdiction or entity rather than within itself. I think that that's, the way I that's the way I read that, where they would have original jurisdiction. Otherwise, it's going to be appellate jurisdiction when it's been an internal state issue. And, it, and the state will resolve that, and then you, then you have the opportunity to decide it was resolved unconstitutionally and make an appeal to the Supreme Court. That goes directly to the Supreme Court, not through the uh, appellate process. Uh, so anyway, that, that's the best I can do on that. Another thing that occurred to me, based partly on the conversation I had during the break, was a, a, another aspect of, we'll probably get into it but when we get to the uh, 15th, 14th Amendment, uh, that our, right, our individual rights are protected uh, according to life, liberty, and property. That's the way it's stated in the Constitution. Invisible Constitution. Uh, does uh, do the federal courts, uh, is it a constitutional issue, gay rights? Life, liberty, and property? Uh, well, a lot of those cases have to do with the rights of gay to, gays to be protected in their property in the same way that heterosexual couples and marriages are protected. So I think that's the way it, it comes in. But the fact that it's limited to life, liberty, and property, our individual rights, then it means in a modern society all sorts of things are, occur that don't automatically come under life, liberty, and property, but then have been by the court system brought in because by fact people bring cases and so on under that, under the 14th Amendment. and. Uh, how, do you, how broadly do you interpret Equity. life, liberty, and property? So that's, that's what um, Tribe means in his book about the invisible constitution being all over the place. And that if we were locked in just to the words of the constitution, we would get hamstrung. And that may answer the question that was raised two classes ago about him being president yeah. in the constitution. <laughs> Uh, and probably that would be interpreted as part of the invisible constitution. Him is a generic him, rather than a specific male. But uh, you could argue on the other side, those guys in Philadelphia were thinking him. They were thinking him. So, so some person who wanted to bring it, I think you could bring a case. You could try to, uh, but you'd, you'd lose, I think, on, on the basis of the invisible constitution. And that's how the invisible constitution sort of helps in, in, in interpreting. But the question is, how far do you go with the invisible constitution? <coughs> All right, um, I'm, I'm going to going to um, go around in four, just in the interest of time. I, there's a few words I've skipped over in the, in the second paragraph or the first paragraph. Anyway, I'm going to the trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crime shall have been committed, but when not committed with any, any state, the trial shall be in such place or places that the Congress may, may by law have direct territories. Uh, they're, they're aware of territories, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But um, there's a problem with this particular part of, the, uh, of uh, Section 1. But the anti-federalists raised over and over again, how about trial by jury in civil cases? Um, Tommy and me in a, in a lawsuit. Uh, don't we have the right to have a jury trial rather than go to just directly to a judge? Most states did have the right of trial by jury in civil cases. Not in the Constitution, but it's going to be in the Bill of Rights. So that's one of the things that the Bill of Rights has to has to do to correct one of the one of the principal charges against the Constitution. This it comes up over and over in anti-federalist. You know, we don't want to prove this Constitution has no right to trial by jury in uh, civil cases, criminal cases, in English law. If if I commit a crime, my crime is against the state, against the crown. Um, so I murder Nisha. Nisha's family has no recourse. I, what I've done is violate the peace of the state. Therefore, the state will bring the charges in a, in a criminal case. You know, the O.J. Simpson thing was interesting because then there was a civil case, and the, and the uh, threshold of proof is a little lower in the civil case than it is in the criminal case. He's 
He's acquitted in the criminal case and found guilty in the civil case when the Brown family, Nicole Brown's family, brought suit for him. I don't know if he's ever paid the millions of dollars he owes them for her life. But yet, Nisha's family uh, would have to bring a civil case against me for what I've done to injure them by depriving them of that wonderful woman. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, section three. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort, aid and comfort to the enemy. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. The Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason but no attainder of treason shall work corruption. So if you've been charged with treason or convicted, work corruption of blood. In other words, it doesn't carry over to your family. Or forfeiture, except during the life of the person attainted. So my property could be uh, <coughs> taken, but my descendants, whatever's left of my descendants, or anything they are under their own, will not be taken because they happen to be related to me. And you can see in, in here that the you know, convicted of treason, uh, uh, to me, adhering to their enemies, or give, uh, giving them aid and comfort. Well, it's a whole What's that going to do to the free press? Uh, in countries that don't have a free press, that people, you know, we find all sorts of uh, uh, media people, television and uh, print media, ending up in jail for essentially treason, not by according to their laws, because they're bringing aid and comfort to the enemy when you attack the government or criticize the government. This is why, again, from the point of view of the anti-federalist, you're going to have to have a, you know, they're pushing, what, 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 it, is, it isn't in the Brutus that you're reading, but no Bill of Rights. No Bill of Rights comes up all the time in the anti-federalist. There's no Bill of Rights here. And so Madison's going to have the charge that if this Constitution is adopted, he's going to have to come up with a Bill of Rights. Somebody, he will do it. And, that, and so, 1791, you've got a Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments of the Constitution. There you've got freedom of the press. So you can begin to counterbalance the mushiness of the treason uh, article, aid and comfort. Uh, where do you draw the line on aid and comfort? Well, now, when, Tommy? when you have... I mean, I'm thinking of Guantanamo, when you have military <coughs> law and U.S. constitutional <coughs> law, you know. Tom, Tommy's question has to do with Guant uh, Guantanamo Bay and uh, bringing uh, military charges against people rather than, and, and we will, let's, um, let's see where we go. Um, Anyway, martial law clause, I'm trying to find, but there is a, there is okay. a clause for martial law. Okay. But, then your question is still a valid question, how do you classify someone as coming under martial law? Obviously, if you're in the military, you, you're under martial law. But how about civilians? Well, you know, people, it was a little easier for the ones who were captured in arms uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan, but not, you know, you're the, the driver for somebody or something like that. Some of those folks ended up at Guantanamo Bay who could be, you know, connected. Yeah. And uh, and they're not, 11 of them are not U.S. citizens, but some, some are US, U.S. citizens, and it gets money. And, you know, this is why Obama came into the administration, said he's going to close Guantanamo and put people under civil law, you know, people who are in prison, hasn't done it. Uh, so, you know, we could question his motives or maybe, what the, you know, responsibility, your responsibilities for national security as president are huge. And so you have to make some decisions there and how, how close to here. He's, he's a constitutional lawyer. If there's anybody who's been president of the United States <laughs> who ought to know our Constitution, it's Barack Obama. Um, George? Yes? Where would you put Edward Snowden? <laughs> MJ's, MJ's question is, where would I put Edward Snowden? Um, there, 
it, it, it's a little, I think, uh, myself and the NL, and we're prisoners of how much we've read and what we've read. But um, Snowden did more than give aid and comfort to the enemy. He revealed classified documents. So when you do that, it's a little closer to something you could call treason. And, 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 and he, uh, he would have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution and so on. So I think there's a somewhat cut and dried case that you could bring charges against him, whether you'd be convicted or not, another question. But yeah, I think this is more than just giving aid and comfort. It, it, it's uh, closer to the, to the uh, definition of treason, I feel. Okay? Um, okay. Well, we we could we could stay we could do four courses on the on the judicial issue, uh, I think so. And I was I was a little worried about this when a I'm I'm not a lawyer and therefore more at sea in, in this than uh, I might be in some sections. B it's an area of huge contemporary interest and controversy and so on, which again underscores the importance of the. Judiciary within our federal system and within our state system, and really, really, really emphasizes that we're a funny system. I mean, we were states that created a, a national government, and it really comes out in the judiciary. Uh, and we're not a top. In that sense, we're not top down. The states have voluntarily, by their votes of uh, ratifying the Constitution, given these powers to our federal government. How much power did they give? And that's in dispute, has been in dispute from the beginning, is still in, in dispute. And then you get into law, and you've got a, a fully developed state court system, 50 different states under a more or less uniform federal system. And how does all that fit together and match? And uh, I, I, if, it, if this doesn't do anything but just make us better readers of what's going on and why there are so many controversies about courts and, and cases and so on, but we have created a very complex system of law, and in a way a kind of messy system of law, and we try, we're trying, we try our best to sort it out, and I would say over time we've been very well served by our judiciary. Uh, we've had really responsible, well-educated, well-trained people, for the most part, in our judiciary. We haven't had a lot of hacks particularly at the federal and supreme and, and higher court level in, in our states. So, uh, and they're trying, they're trying their best to make this very complex system of concurrent jurisdictions work out. And then we've got the, got the federal court system which has to interpret the constitutionality of laws within the framework of a constitution that's both visible and, and, and invisible. So, and then they help to create an invisible. Constitution. So, a very interesting part of our Constitution, and I think a very complex one, even though it's one of the shorter articles in the Constitution. Can, yeah? Can, can uh, something that came in front of the Supreme Court, and they made a law, like letting all the money in on politics, okay, can they reverse it at some point? Yes. It, Certainly. It, the, the question is, uh, with respect to Citizens United, could that be reversed? And uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I'd say yes. Because there were, there were laws and precedents prior to Citizens United which were used to keep a, a, lot, a lot of that kind of... In other words, it, it used at least to make you responsible for the money you give. I mean, to be able to give money and not have to own up to the fact that you've done it, to do it surreptitiously, is what... Citizens United allow because it's an infringement of your free speech to, to, to make you uh, come clean. And I think it, I think it's free speech is, you know, you you've done it and you've spoken up. Now who did it? Yeah, I, I did it. Then. Well, free speech is one thing. The right to know is something else. I think that's yeah. where we're getting lost in the shuffle here. Yeah. And so I mean it's it's uh, and it's, it's again corporations are people. You know that isn't in the Constitution, but beginning to be thought. Uh, now they have just as many rights as, as a person would have. So the precedents leading up to Citizens United were somewhat, somewhat, and moderately in the other direction to try to limit 
the uh, contributions, the amount you could give, any one person could give, and also to attribute. And so now we've moved in a direction, different direction. So I think uh, it would be possible to overturn it. Though again, there are some constitutional lawyers who are arguing the only, well, the only remedy is a con constitutional amendment. And that was sort of once and for all settled this. Um, so I, I'm on, again, I'm on shaky ground. I should, should just stop with that because it gets shakier and shakier the more, the more I say. So. <laughs> and and uh, it is interesting the difference between sort of um, looking at the Constitution in a historical and present day context and then be looking at it as a constitutional lawyer because this book that, that uh, loaned to me, uh, it, the first part of the book deals more generally with principles, which I could understand. Then the second part of the book deals with all these Supreme Court cases. Not real constitutional law, and I begin to get lost there. So, uh, it is a very deep thicket, uh, the, the area uh, of constitutional law. Okay, let's go to Article 4 and see how we can do with this. Um, this is one I've said, it sort of deals with the state's relationship and they're, they're, uh, how, how we've, we've now given, made this federal government. We've talked about the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. How, what about the states in relation to this federal government? Full faith and credit shall be given to, in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. Reciprocity. I mean, we've, in other words, we're, we're still we're within this system. We're pretty strong entities. And we have to give full faith and credit to each other and our processes and so on. So this is trying to balance out the relationship of the states. And the Congress may, by general laws, prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof. So when, again, it's that ar arbitration aspect of Congress. How are we going to sort it out? It's not, it's, it's too messy, too open to corruption and so on, if the states themselves have to sort all this out. And, and the federal government has a responsibility to help the states to live equitably with each other, is, is what that's saying. Section 2, citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. Now that's, I, I think it's fair, you know, it's, it's a little harder to uh, fully interpret, but it essentially it's saying that and it's sort of turned out that way. Um, you know, when we move from state to state, we notice the laws are a little different and we have to do certain things differently. But generally, we feel we're a part of the same job in the United States. It's just not a big deal to go from one state to the other. Except the gay rights thing is just <laughs> Tommy says, except the gay rights thing is, yeah, that's right. And, and you, 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 could, you could wonder at a certain point whether this clause would come into some court case. You know, and, and uh, you know, it, it, whether you just have to honor. Uh, if you're in Mississippi, you just have to honor the Iowa laws. Or something. For a long time, for whites only, laws that in, in made legal uh, segregation that's right. And, well, yeah, that's an even, even, even stronger example of uh, Ken saying uh, during Jim Crow and uh, the treatment of a black person from, from uh, Wyoming or Iowa going to Mississippi and so on. Uh, not getting the same treatment in Mississippi that you would get in Iowa. And that certainly is in contrast to the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. And, and when we get to the, which we won't today, I'm pretty sure now, I get to the 13th, 15th Amendment, we will next time, I'm pretty sure then. But, but, the, 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 the issue here is, on this equitable thing, is that those things would be enforced within the state where you were. And the co state courts in the, were, were, you know, fully supportive of Jim Crow and had ways of figuring out how to enforce that. So, um, so what, what we, what, I think what you're saying is that this is a very nice statement, <laughs> but it has been honored in the breach many, many times. And uh, well, again, when we come to those, when we come to the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, you've got federal law invading the states' rights to determine who can vote. 
That's been a state right. That states have the, you know, right in the Constitution, have the right to determine. And some of them had property qualifications, some of them didn't. That was the way it was. So they gave the states the right to control the voting process. Whoa! The federal government and the 13th, well, particularly the 15th Amendment, but the 14th Amendment particularly, is invading the right of the states to determine who can vote. Because the states and those in the Jim Crow states were obviously restricting, restricting, restricting the vote of black people. On what grounds can the federal government invade it? The grounds were, when we come to it, the federal government guarantees a Republican government in every state. It was on that basis that the federal government intervenes that these are not Republican governments. We're going to guarantee it. And then, then what, what, what will be in really, and I want to get to this next time, is how they got away after the 15th Amendment with keeping blacks from voting. And they did until 1964-65 with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. We had to do it all over again almost 100 years later. How did they get away with it? We have a handout that, that kind of explains that, so look at that handout and we'll talk about it next time. But yeah, this, this, this federal system with all these different states, powers and rights. I don't um, I don't remember what state it was, but a week or 10 days ago, one of the southern states, is, it may have been Kentucky, yes. uh, their legislature voted that they would recognize gay marriage of people who came into their state uh, from another state who were legally married in another state. They would not affirm gay marriage and make it the law of the land in that state but they would recognize marriages from other states. And I, 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 it just seems almost redundant. They're just repeating what it says here in the Constitution, which yeah. should just be so what, what I was saying is that this particular section, first paragraph of Section 2, has been asserted. He thinks it's in Kentucky that will honor gay marriage in other states. They don't have it for themselves, but they'll honor it. Which is, uh, you're right, that they're following what the Constitution says. But because of the times when it's been honored in the breach rather than the affirmation, I guess it's it's still necessary to do that. So I mean, your your questions are really very good in terms of that blanket statement I made that made that generally speaking we're comfortable moving from state to state. But there are lots of exceptions. There are lots there are lots of exceptions. But this was an effort in the Constitution to to uh, make that process as easy as possible. Now, a person charged in any state with treason, felony, or other crime who shall flee from justice and be found in another state shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime. Extradition. So, um, someone uh, uh, from Texas who does, you know, commits a crime in Iowa and run, runs away to Texas and then will have we send out the notice and as he's apprehended, we'll be returned to Iowa to face it. You're going to be tried in the state where the crime is committed, uh, even though you live in another state. No person held a service. Uh, interesting. Now, where is, what, where is uh, slavery in the Constitution? Here it is again. No person held a service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom the service or labor may be due. Fugitive slave law. Yeah. So fugitive slaves have to be returned by the Constitution. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that Tribe says in his book is, it's kind of amazing that the, the, the Constitution is unexpurgated. It hasn't been cleaned up. So we can see the unfolding history of our society in, as we read the Constitution. The amendments are going to correct that, but you're going to have to wait for the amendments. And they don't go back and say, take it out of the Constitution. And we want to remove that, that, that blight on our, on our history. Well, the blights on our history are there. And here it is. Okay. Uh, new states. Now, this is really interesting. New states. And this, this was a big, big issue. I mentioned that Maryland held up the ratification of the Articles of Confederation between 1777 and 1781. They weren't ratified because Maryland had to be ratified by all the states. And Maryland held off because they wanted this issue of territories settled. They didn't want Virginia or Pennsylvania, for example, to extend all the way to the Pacific Ocean. 
Yeah. Smalls. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, Pacific, yeah. And which theoretically they could if they could pull it off in terms of their, their land grants from the British Crown. Uh, whereas Maryland, which was locked in, can't do that. So a small state becomes even smaller and smaller and smaller. And as these territorial issues are settled. So this is the Constitution's effort to settle this. Uh, so new states may be admitted uh, by the Congress in, into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states, or parts of states, without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as the Congress. Uh, now, have you heard the, the discussion about dividing California into six different states? Yeah, yeah. Silicon Valley will be a state. Well, clearly, they could do it if the, if the legislature of California approved it and the U.S. Congress approved it, but they can't do it on their own. They can't secede and you know, break up California without, within the Constitution without those dual approvals of the state of, of California and the, the federal. So it's unlikely to happen. I don't think California legislature is going to let Silicon Valley go. No. They're most no. happy to talk tax revenues, things like that. And that, of course, is why Silicon Valley might want to go. Just keep our money, just keep all our money there, funding all the indigenous in, in L.A. Uh, here. Eric. It should be noted that Texas actually can do that because they made the agreement before they joined the union. Yeah, Eric say Texas uh, would claim they could do this anyway because they made the agreement before they joined the union. That, that it, the state could divide into as many as five states. Yeah. I, I'm guessing that the Constitution would override that, but they... Uh, well, it's, it's actually, it's, um, when it was annexed into the United States, as it was its own separate nation, right. the agreement was made, it was drafted, so it's a legal document saying that Texas could... At a point okay. In the future divided into five different states. So and Eric's point is that it, be, it was a part of the agreement of Texas joining the U.S. So it, it is uh, supersedes this element in the Constitution. They anticipate. And, <laughs> okay. So they're the one state that can go their own way. <laughs> I'm glad to know that. <laughs> Some would say, let them go. <laughs> misinformed when he talks about them being able to secede. They, they never got a document saying they could secede, but they did get one saying they could break into five different states. Okay. Yeah. That might help, too. But yeah. he, <laughs> he, should have, he should have taken his Texas history course in seventh grade like the rest of us. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, what a wonderful group. I mean, there really is an absolute cornucopia of my knowledge here. Jack. I wish sure Mexico had won back. Yeah. <laughs> Jack's comment is he's not sure Mexico won back. I don't think they want to go to Mexico either. Lone Star State, remember. Okay. Um, Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States, and nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or any particular state. Now, it, this is really kind of interesting when you... In July of 1787, during the Constitutional Convention, the Northwest Ordinance was passed by the, Con by the Congress. So simultaneous with the Constitutional Convention, the Congress does probably the most important thing it did in its whole time, was to create the, the Northwest Ordinance, which, which was for the regulations governing the area from the Appalachians north of the Ohio River and over to the Mississippi. That was, that was the territory in the Northwest. And it laid out how the state, you had to have 60,000 people to become a state. Ohio was the first of them to become a state in 1803. Um, it it, it, it um, outlawed slavery in those territories. And the South is going to keep pushing against that. Um, and a number of other very, uh, free navigation on the rivers. No state's going to control the rivers. Uh, they, are, they belong to us collectively, and so on. Very interesting principles of how you organize the territories that's going to become the, the template for future actions regarding territories and, and bringing them into states. 
Is there any reference in the Constitution as to who determines the boundaries of a state? Uh, the, 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 the John's are. question is, uh, is there any reference in the Constitution as to who determines the boundaries? The, the answer is no, but this, by law, uh, various laws were passed. For, for example, as you begin to get into the Trans-Mississippi West, they're trying to create states with relatively equal uh, areas. And so you get, as you go, you would say they didn't totally succeed by any means, but you, as you get across the Mississippi, you get more equivalency of size of states than you've had before, where they've developed in very different well, ways. Well, at the time of the Constitution, were, were there any disputes between the current states as to boundaries? Yeah, and I, I'm trying to remember if there isn't, but let's wait and see if we don't find something. There is something about that. I'm trying to remember where I saw that, but I think it may be in the Constitution as to disputes. Uh, and, and generally speaking, uh, as part of the process of ratification, the states do agree to be much more reasonable with each other about their boundaries. And, because there are all kinds of boundary disputes going on. Dorothy? I read something recently, and I can't remember where, but what, what kind of tidbit of history can you share regarding the, uh, the breakup? I, I don't know if it was Virginia, Kentucky, or, or the two Virginias, how, how Virginia and well, Virginia and West Virginia. Well, West Virginia was at the Civil War. That was the non-slave portion part of the question was Virginia's breakup. And uh, it, it breaks up into two different part, or three part, I mean, Virginia. Kentucky, they voluntarily relinquish that, that, that Virginia agrees with the creation of the state of Kentucky, which happens very shortly after the Constitution is adopted. West Virginia, they lost. Uh, when, they, when, they went to the Confe when Virginia went to the Confederacy, West Virginia did not go with them, and declared themselves independent of Virginia and a separate state. And of course, the federal government, i.e. the northern states, were glad to welcome West Virginia into the union. That's how that happened. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Um, where, yeah, before. Okay, here we are. Here comes this clause. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. This is going to be hugely important after the Civil War in terms of the U.S. government reaching in and invading the right of states to uh, putting some restrictions on the right of states to uh, uh, govern who can vote and who can't vote. So that, that's huge. And shall protect each of them against invasion and application of the legislature or the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against and against domestic violence. Now that, this, this, this has a um, very uh, tr uh, trenchant uh, feeling for the people at the Constitutional Convention. Shays' Rebellion. That just at the eve of the Constitutional Convention, there was a rebellion in western Massachusetts of mostly farmers who owed lots of money to bankers in Boston. And they were pushing for two things, for paper money, which would make their debt less, less, uh, and for relief on taxes. And they weren't getting it. And they felt they were, that their interests were being overridden by a bunch of painters in Boston, and they rebelled. And the Boston, the Massachusetts militia was having a hard time quelling that rebellion. It went on for months, about eight or nine months. Right as the Constitution Convention is coming together, it helps, helps to create the environment of the Constitutional Convention of, yeah, we've got to have some sort of federal system that will help us to put these things down. Because the other states weren't coming to the aid of Massachusetts. Massachusetts was on its own and was struggling. So here it goes into the Constitution that the, that the United States will guarantee to every state their security. And, and even against a foreign invasion or against domestic turmoil. So there it is in the Constitution. Okay, uh, Joanne is waving the, uh, uh, the time at me. Um, I think, well, actually, I, we've got about three minutes. And I think we can, do, believe it or not, I think we can do Article 5. Let's do it quick. <laughs> Amendments. And it's really important. You can amend this Constitution, and you don't have to have every state in it which you did have to have in the Articles of Confederation result, no amendments there. 
but we've had 27 amendments to our Constitution. Congress, when two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution. So two-thirds of both houses can propose an amendment. Or, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, so it can come from the top or from the bottom. Bottom, if you think of states, the bottom, which they really aren't. But it can come up or come down. So two-thirds, either in Congress or in the state legislature, shall call a convention for opposing, uh, proposing amendment. Now, the Congress itself can propose the amendments, or the states have to have a convention, call a convention to propose the amendments, which shall in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution. So amendments are going to become part of the Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the states. So you have to have three-fourths of the states ratified a constitutional amendment. So you need, it's got to be a supermajority to amend the Constitution. So the result, it has been 27, and it isn't 100, it isn't 100 but it isn't 5 either. Um, and and Motor may propose, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Um, so last part, you can't be taken, you can't take your two senators away. The other one has to do with that, 18, that for 20 years there shall be a slave trade, and then we'll consider it after 20 years. So you can't change that. That's, there's the southern states coming in again. Don't mess with that. You can't amend it out, or you can't touch it. So there can't be any amendments about that. That's what that's. Okay. We've got only two articles to go next time, and um, many, if not most, of the amendments. Many of the amendments, we'll say. Thank you very, very much. I think that July 4th idea is starting to look pretty good. <laughs> but you will notice on your tables today that you have uh, the bucket stuffers for the spring season. And we will have, um, talk more about that and give you an opportunity to sign up for my teacher's class next week. So take your school with you, and then we will be back next week for the last class, I'm sorry to say, of George Drake's course on our Constitution from origin to implementation. See you next week.